Welcome to episode 258 of Grid Talk. Today we're here to preview the 2023 Bahrain Grand Prix and have a little bit of a review of the pre-season testing. My name is Ruby Price and joining me we have Grid Talk co-host Tom Downey. Hello. Grip Strip podcast host Philip Matthew. Hello. And Formula Talk host and the F1 member Sophia Richmond. Hi. But first, if you enjoy this podcast, we would love it if you could take five to leave us a five-star rating on Spotify or a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. And if you're one of the 72% of people who aren't yet subscribed to our YouTube channel, please consider helping us out with a like and a subscribe. So pre-season testing is done. We've had the cars on track and a lot of running. But of course, it is worth mentioning that testing means nothing. And really, it's all about what happens when the lights go out this weekend in Bahrain, and the 2023 season finally gets underway. Tom, the teams have been gathering data for the last few days. Who impressed you during the pre-season test? Um, I'm going to say, obviously I'm going to say this, I'm going to say Red Bull. And I can see, you. yeah, shock horror, I know. But yeah, no, I'm going to say Red Bull because you know after a couple of the issues they had at the start of last season, you know, with their powertrains and you know, obviously the... The double DNF last year oh, still hurts. It's uh, you, you know they just had com- what appeared to be completely flawless running. You know Max racked up hundred and something laps. Checo topped the time and sheets on the last day. They just look slick. The car looks good. It looks quick. It looks consistent. It looks you know it appears to be reliable. But obviously everything is fresh. I take it with a pinch of salt. Didn't seem to be too much porpoising. Uh, yeah, and you know, drivers are happy. Teams look happy. Could just be could just be a sort of. Uh, sort of happy front they're putting on, but everybody looks happy. Car looks good. Drivers look good. Yeah. I mean, what would you expect from the world champions? What would you expect indeed? Phil, we're in an era of F1 now where there is fantastic reliability, but we do have less testing than ever before. There's several rookies on the field for 2023. How prepared will they be feeling having only had three days of on-track running ahead of their debut Formula One seasons? I think with the advent of the Sims and being in there for a long time, they don't restrict that time. They're going to be as prepared as they can be. Yes, FP1s are going to be much more important for them. That extra set of tires that they get uh, during each race will be crucial. Uh, But, I mean, now that they have this test here and they're going to race next week, it'll, it'll probably be good for them. For this race, I think the bigger question will start at Saudi the following weekend at further races uh, in terms of the experience relative to some of their more their veteran teammates. Yeah, absolutely. And Sophia, finally on testing, at least, we've had two new tyre compounds for 2023, a new extreme wet tyre, which we obviously didn't see in the desert of Bahrain, but also a new C1 tyre that is a bit softer than the C1 of last season, which is now the C0. The teams have been running a number of these tyres over the last few days. How much of an impact do you think this new compound will have when we do see it? To be fair, a lot of the fastest times on the timing sheets have been more in the C2 and C3 um, compounds, more so not the new ones. I think we're going to see it more on some of the um, tracks where obviously grip is definitely more needed. With the wets, uh, (laughs) we'll see. I mean, obviously, like you mentioned, like, it's not going to rain Bahrain. It's not going to rain in Saudi. I don't think it's going to rain in Australia or Azerbaijan. So we probably won't see that until probably we get to the European um, racing. From what's been said by Pirelli, it's been very mixed reviews on some of the information from the drivers. I think after the first probably two races, we'll probably get to see a lot more information and see if there's anything else coming in. I do agree that we needed better tyres. Uh, given how last season, like a lot of them struggle with the grip. I think also how degradation will be. And especially with coming into, is it the next season that uh, warming blankets will be not allowed? I think bringing in a new tire the season before that as well will kind of key, play a key thing. And then obviously with um, qualifying the new structure of that, um, will those new tires, the new uh, C0 tires come into effect for qualifying as well? Yeah, definitely. There are new rules for qualifying at, I think, two races this um, season where teams will have to run the hard in Q1, the medium in Q2 and the soft in Q3 for whichever set of Pirelli tyres that they choose. But Mario Silva, just to comment on what you were saying, obviously, about tyre blankets, did say that if it doesn't happen in 2024, it will happen in 2025. 
But ultimately, tyre blankets are going to go. Um, it only really didn't happen this season because there was a lot of protest from teams and drivers and all of that jazz. But on to the Bahrain Grand Prix weekend then. And let's start with last year's back Marcus Williams. Tom, they've got rookie Logan Sargent and former Red Bull driver Alex Albon. They certainly stacked up a lot of mileage amongst some issues. Where do you think Williams are after testing and how do you think they will fare in this weekend's race? Um, I think they're going to be at the back of the grid. I'm going to be frank. They are, they're, they're just, I'm not seeing enough from, from Williams. He, you know, I, I know they've, they've got, they've got James Vowles from, um, James Vowles, however you say it, from, um, uh, from Mercedes, which, which is, which is a good call. Hopefully that, can, hopefully they can, you know, he can sort of steer the team. I still think they shouldn't have got rid of, um, of Dos Capito, but he's gone. Um, Obviously, dumping the C3 is going to benefit them. I think Logan Sargent is a much better fit for that seat. You know, he showed more in his junior series. Um, they did do pretty well in testing, but I just, you know, you know, uh, like you said in the intro, you can't team. Uh, sorry, you can't take testing as some. Um, you can't take it as gospel. So that's how teams going to go. I'd really like to be proved wrong because I'm sure a lot of us would like to see Williams sort of like. Perhaps just even in Q2 regularly, but I just I just don't see them doing that well. Um, I think they're going to go through a couple of seasons of rebuilding. Um, a bit like they did in sort of 2021, you know, and then ultimately went backwards. But now that they've got two decent drivers, Albon is on a you know, bit, bit more of a long-term contract. I think Sargent will probably be there for a while as well. If they can just get some stability, both with staff, you know, so team principals, you know, technical directors, all that kind of thing, and also their drivers, I think perhaps 2024, 2025, we can start to see them do a bit better. But I think right now, I'm not too sure. Yeah, Logan Sargent, of course, the first American F1 driver to be racing, provided it actually happens in Bahrain this weekend. And, and if he does make it through an entire season, the first American driver to complete a full season since Scott Speed. Um, moving on to our resident American, Phil. Um, on to last season's P9 was Alpha Towery, the Red Bull Junior outfit. Dutch rookie Nick De Vries has joined the team from Mercedes and they've kept Yuki Tsunoda on for a third season. The team haven't looked so confident during testing and there is a suspicion that they will be at the back. But do you think they can turn it around in the week, considering they've traditionally po- performed well here in the past? I, I, Gasly was the one that did perform well generally. And I mean, to be fair, Sonoda uh, has had a decent result there or two, I think. But they're going to have problems this year. Um, the rumors are Red Bull proper now that. Um, we've lost Matisic, uh, that they're looking at all their business entities and they're seeing ha- here, um, yep, yeah, I, I kind of thought that he did, and well, that's true, so thank you, Ruby. Um, yeah, it's a noted it score points there. In terms of law, I mean, in terms of this weekend, maybe they'll, they'll have a, a good shot to be out there on the back end of the points and have a possibility of a Q3 appearance. Though across the season, I do not have very high hopes for them. I also think that the the rumor of them possibly being sold or having to move is going to make um, things a little bit more unstable. I, getting DeVries in there is a good recovery mode move there because uh, he seems like a really stable driver to bring in, um, non-Red Bull guy, so that actually speaks a lot to their driver development program, of course. But... Um, he will be some a stabilizing force for them, and I think you will see more results out of him than Yuki. Um, but that, of course, is to be determined. Maybe he'll prove me wrong. Yeah, I think Yuki Tsunoda does need to have a very strong season for him to still be around in 2024. Um, and it will be interesting to see if Nick DeVries does out score him over the course of the season. Sophia, moving on to Haas, they've dropped Mick Schumacher for Nico Hulkenberg, very famously podiumless. Um, and last season's surprise returnee, Kevin Magnussen, who has had a very promising testing. Uh, do you think Haas will continue their upwards trajectory? And how competitive do you think the American outfit will be? Oh, um, I mean, 
Last season, I think I said on podcast, I do not agree on Nico Hulkenberg coming back. I think it could have been uh, Pietro Phil Pauli, uh, even some other drivers. I think given he obviously was a super sub in races, he's not had a proper season since, since what, 2019? That's a big difference with different regulations, different changes. I mean, I think they may be banking on the fact that with Kevin taking a year out, coming into a new car reg, scoring points, absolutely killing it for Haas. I think they thought that maybe because Nico is seasoned veteran as well, that maybe might be the same. I'm not expecting much. If we looked at how testing was as well, Haas would have kind of not even talked about that much. The only time they talked about it is the three-seater pit wall to save money for development. I think that's the only time I've really heard about Haas um, speaking. And they're really looking to cut like costs down, which is – you, you know it's for Haas will happen, and especially with the new partners and money grab as well. I think this season will be more of another development season with a few odd surprises, like how we had last year with Brazil with um, um, Kevin Magson taking pole and everything. I'm not expecting much. I think they actually will actually be at the bottom of the table at the end of the season, but we'll see. Like I said, I don't like Nico Hulkenberg. Like he's a great super sub, but as a full time season driver. I, I'm not a big fan at all. Follow-up question then. Is he going to get his podium this season? <laughs> um, given how Haas was, I think it would take another miracle of getting a pole to maybe get a podium of some sort. I do think he will finish in the top five in one of the races. Not sure which, because we don't know, because obviously how we can't take testing as a be-all, end-all, as we've seen last season and probably we will see next weekend. But I do think there will be a lot of opportunities that Haas will have at least one driver in top 10 and at least maybe Nico or Kevin finishing in top five more than once, hopefully. Yeah, it'll be uh, if if it does, if that podium does materialize, I think the Internet will be divided as usual, but it will be certainly a side to see. Tom, Aston Martin have a new driver for 2023 in the form of promising veteran Fernando Alonso, Um, but there are still question marks over who will be driving alongside him for the first race, as Lance Stroll has reportedly broken both wrists in a cycling accident and has very noticeably missed pre-season testing with Felipe Drogovic filling in. Who do you think Aston will have in that second car and where do you think they'll be in Bahrain? Um, First of all, I hope Stroll gets better soon because two broken wrists, called alive, that's, um, and I think potentially some broken ribs, that is not going to be pleasant. So, yeah, so uh, so Stroll, I doubt you're listening, but I hope you're doing okay. Um, Yeah, so to say, Fernando's taught him well and had to do pre-season. With regards to who's going to be in in that seat, um, uh, I would say Dragovic. This is all caveated that if Stroll is not fit enough to 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 return, um, I would say Dragovic mainly because he is you know you know he is part of the Aston Drive uh, sorry the Aston Driver Martin Academy the Aston Martin Driver Academy. Let me try that one again. Um, and he um, you know and, and he's obviously just done a load of testing in the car. You know, he's going to be a lot more fresh with it. Um, they do have Soffel Van Dorn on their books as well. Um, so you know, so he could potentially do it, but I, I think to me, Djokovic would make more sense. And given he's the most recent F2 champion, uh, Van Dorn is, I believe, still racing in Formula E. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, thank you. I, I, I thought I thought he was, you know, so he's gonna have other racing commitments. Um, yeah, I, I, I'd like to see Djokovic in that car, and and I, and I also think that I think Djokovic would do a good job in that car. Um, he's probably learning an awful lot from um, from uh, Fernando Alonso. With regards to where that car is going to be, I hope they can continue their form from the tail end of last season, where they actually really started to to pick up quite a bit. Whether they will remains to be seen. I think they're going to be sort of, I say firmly in the midfield. They're going to be sort of around sort of like P six, P seven in the constructors kind of kind of region. I don't think they're going to be enough to battle Alpine and um uh McLaren as such. Um but yeah it's going to be interesting. 
certainly will. And if they do decide to go with Felipe Drogovic over Stoffel van Dorn, who is the official from Aston Martin reserve driver, it will be the second time in a row that Stoffel van Dorn has been um, not chosen over another driver um, when caught, when required to be called upon, um, which is just a little you know tidbit if you think back to Sakir 2020. Phil, Alfa Romeo have a new team principal for 2023 in the form of McLaren's previous, um, I don't know, I think he was also just a team principal, Andrea Seidel. Seidel. Um, but they've kept the same driver lineup of Valtteri Bottas, sporting his Australian look, and Joe Guan Yu, the latter finishing the second day of testing with the quickest time. Is that a sign of things to come this weekend, or would it be more realistic to expect to see the Swiss outfit somewhere in the midfield? Yeah, they're going to be in the midfield. I mean, there's early in the season last year, they definitely had a lot more pace and uh, the reliability issues kind of were what stopped them and affected them. And then during the rest of the season, probably the last two thirds of the season, they were just scrapping for a point here and there. Uh, Joe showing progression in his second year is a good thing. Uh, I think the stability is nice for Seidel and who, whoever else is going to be their actual the team principal that will be on the ground uh, for them week to week. But I think for Botas also sporting the mullet helmet and all that, he's, he's really opened up his, his uh, personality, and I think he's really more relaxed, which is a good thing. I don't know how long he's going to hold on, if he's going to hold on long enough to be a part of the Audi program but he is definitely somebody that will be he'll he'll do everything he can to score points he's done that when he was at Williams and a lot at at Mercedes too so I mean mid midfield you know scraping towards the back end of the points trying to get a Q3 appearance here and there but I think that's where they are or where they were last year is kind of where they're going to be again this year yeah, definitely um, one to think about in the midfield then. Sophia, uh, McLaren have arguably had a bit of a horrible preseason testing week with both rookie Oscar Piastri and Lando Norris both having issues and spending a lot of time in the garage. This time last year, McLaren were also suffering issues with their brakes, but we did see them bounce back a few times and did claim the only podium outside of the top three teams. Where do you think McLaren are performance-wise, and do you think they can springboard up the midfield based on what we've seen? Short answer, no. Um, I think I'm getting flashbacks, obviously, of last season, how testing was, and I think it's going to be the same situation. Um, obviously, the situation that they've been having this week was about, like, the wheel brow. Um, you kept on seeing them take off the wheels and putting, like, the metal plates on. I think it's not the best thing for Oscar Piastri as well. Um, given he has raced or well, tested in other McLarens before, I think that's also a good thing. But however, obviously he tested them pre-2020 regs. So there is a bit of a difference as we saw the difference from uh, the drivers comparing it from the 2021 to 2022. I'm not expecting much. And that's coming from a McLaren fan. Like I think they're probably going to try to keep the same. I think this is Lando season to lose against Oscar because Oscar's coming in with a lot of pressure, given the fact that he won F3 in this rookie year, he won F2 in this rookie year. The only other people that have done that is Charles Leclerc and George Russell, and look how well they are performing in F1. There's a lot of pressure from that. And also the fact that he took Daniel Ricciardo's spot, well, didn't take, but he's filling in Daniel Ricciardo's spot. That's also putting a lot of pressure through the media, comparing himself to Daniel Ricciardo. Again, another Australian. And I think coming into it, if... Oscar perform, performs better than Lando, that's going to be a big sh like shake because Lando did so well last season, being quite consistent and getting the points from McLaren. If Oscar's come in as a rookie, I don't know how that's going to feel. And especially because Lando's been signed until 2025, 2026 as well. That could have another play in the conversation about contracts, but I think they're going to stay where they are. I'm hoping for more podiums. I'm hoping for Lando's first win. I would love to see that. And also Oscar getting points on debut. I think it's possible. He's raced in Bahrain a few times in F2 and F3. I don't think it's not unrealistic to say that he will get at least one or two points next weekend. 
Yeah, and Bahrain as well has shown to be a good opportunity for um, rookies making their debut to get points on their debut. Tom, um, rumours are that Alpine are best of the rest so P4 basic, uh, P4 in the constructors basically, um, but they have got an issue with bouncing as well as trouble removing the rear wheels of from their car in pit stop simulations. Uh, the French, the old French outfit welcomes back Esteban Ocon and the new addition to the team Pierre Gasly for 2023. Do you agree that Alpine are probably the fourth best constructor right now? And how do you think they will fare next weekend? I think in terms of raw pace, they probably are. But with Alpine, there's that always question of their just woeful reliability because we all know that Alpine last year cost Alonso the championship because he lost so many points. Um, you know, for example, as he, as he outright told us. Um, yeah, it's just a, it's a bit of an odd issue to have um, re- you know, not being able to remove the rear wheels properly. It's like, you know, maybe they're taking inspiration from Bottas in Monaco in 2021 or something, but, uh, you know, uh, but, you know, I, I, I don't know, I'm just speculating. Um, I, I, you know, I don't know if it's a case of, you know, you know the, you know, the, the nut not sitting properly on, on the, um, you know, on, on, on the wheel hub or, you know, or if, or if just the wheels are heavier than, than expected, it's not coming in, you not, Sort of like lifting and removing them at the right angle. I don't know. I I haven't I haven't seen the fo- I read reports of it, but I haven't seen footage of the issues they had. Um, the porpoising is still a big thing with these new ground effects or these you know whatever you want to call it. You know the, these this new era of cars. Obviously, we saw it a lot last year, um, and I did see footage of I can't remember which Alpine driver it was, but they were when they were coming down the main street, they were bouncing around a fair bit. Which you know, is is you know a that's going to be pretty damn uncomfortable and you know that's that's going to cause you know all sorts of issues. So you know not least with the car, I'm thinking more like the driver's health, you know, because they're going to start to get headaches. You know, it could cause you know if it got bad enough, it could cause a like concussion or something. Um, you know, you know, in, in like a sort of like a worst case scenario. Um, Alpine have got the potential to finish like quite way up there. You know, they've got two race winners on their team, the two most recent race winners in F1 on their team, um, you know, who are obviously both French drivers. Whether they will... Um, ugh, yeah, actually, no, tell I know they're not the two most recent race uh, winners because Perez won secure after... Um, after can I take that back? Um... But um, but yeah, you, you know they're both good. They're both good drivers. You know, I, I you know I, I I rate Ocon and I rate Gasly. Um, I think the, the issue they're gonna have, the issue Alpine are gonna have is a reliability and b if they can get those two to play nice. So they can finish fourth. The question is, will they implode midway through the season? anything's guaranteed for an Alpine is that there will probably be some form of im slash explosion. Um, but I think the team would prefer it to be um, the drivers than the car, um, given what's happened previously. But Phil, the former world champions Mercedes look to absolve their porpoising issues from 2022, but both George Russell and Sir Lewis Hamilton faced issues during testing and reported setup problems, as well as George Russell suffering a hydraulic failure on day two. But they finished day three of testing just off the top, and despite the issues last season, did finish on the podium after other drivers retired here in Bahrain. Podiums for Mercedes in Bahrain 2023, or do you think they're still facing a challenge? Well, they're facing a challenge, Ruby, for sure. Uh, They're not at the same level as Tom's Red Bull team or, I mean, to a lesser extent, Ferrari, but they are much closer than they were this time a year ago, which is progression, of course. Uh, I don't think we're going to see what Mercedes truly has here in the first two races. I think Australia and that next, like, group of races that they have is where we will see what Lewis and George have to to fight with. And I know George was battling for points every single race. He was able to finish. He got points. And of course, he got his maiden pole and win. Or, I mean, maiden win. Uh, well, yeah, he did win the sprint race and theoretically was a pole. Yeah. So 
at Brazil. Lewis didn't get either of those last year. I know he's motivated to go and make up for that. Uh, but as a Mercedes fan, I'm keeping my, uh, um, I guess, hopes muted, at least for the first two races, uh, based on just in general across the board. Um, the car looks better. It seems to be better. The drivers are happier. Let's see how that uh, translates. Hoping that they'll make Q3 relatively easily in this race at uh, Bahrain and that they will, if anything, they're in their own little world um, trying to battle with Ferrari, worst case scenario, and Checo Perez. That would be the best case. And uh, through two weeks and try to get the most points out of that and then kind of see where things fall afterwards at Australia and after. Absolutely. And I will say, as someone who did this season review last uh, season in my underwear, don't gamble against Mercedes winning at some point. Um, as soon as you make that kind of bet as well, it's just going to happen. Um but yeah, Sophia, um, a lot can be said for Ferrari in 2022, but with the new team principal, Fred Vasseur, heading up the Italian outfit and Charles Leclerc winning last year and Carlos Sainz finishing runner-up, do you expect to see the Scarlet cars P1 and P2 again this weekend? I hope not because of the barring curse. <laughs> That's like my only thing. Um, for those that don't know about the curse, whoever wins Bahrain does not win the World Championship. It's actually whoever... Most of the time, it's been whoever finished the second win. But obviously, with Red Bull's D, uh, double DNF last season, that wasn't the case. But in previous years, it's always whoever finished the second wins um, the World Championship. I don't want that to happen in the nicest way possible. And I'm sorry to Ferrari fans, purely because I am superstitious. Super and then obviously, like statistics and numbers is my kind of thing. I do think that they are going to be strong. We saw them at the testing topping the timing sheets occasionally they or in the top three very easily. I think Fred coming in as well, he seeing his interviews, he's not giving away anything, even though like Rachel Brooks and Laura Winter are trying to get all the information out. I think he's keeping a very tight lip. And I think him also bringing in new people into um, the decision makings and race control into that. I think that'll be better because obviously we know that majority of the mistakes of Ferrari last season was also by um, the uh, race control, well, uh, Ferrari's um, team making the calls, which probably went the best. I think bringing in some new blood will be good. I think also how well Fred's done in Alpha as well, um, I think will play a new breath of fresh air to the team, especially given that morale is probably very low, given <laughs> they were so close to winning a few times. Um, Charles was right up there for the first half of the season and then it just completely plummeted by bad mistakes, bad calls. I think their reliability won't be as much of an issue this season, I hope. And I do think they're a little bit behind on Red Bull, but I do think it's going to be closer than we're assuming. Because right now they're playing it down tremendously, saying we're not close to Red Bull at all. Like we're not like we're not in the championship winning kind of position. But I do think it's going to be very close. And Charles is wanting to win. Like and for me again, I like numbers and superstition. He's number 16. It's been 16 years since a Ferrari has uh, won a world championship. And it's also, I think, there's another one about 16 as well, but there's three 16s that are taking place this season. And I think that's also kind of a cool kind of thing to have as well. But we'll see how it is in Bahrain. Like I said, I'm hoping maybe finishing second or third, but definitely not P1 because of the superstition. Well, I can't remember if it's been 16 races since Austria, but it has been a while since the last Ferrari race win as well. But Tom, uh, the team everyone, including yourself, obviously, will be watching this weekend is, of course, last season's champions, Red Bull. Max Verstappen is the reigning world champion and she and Jeco Perez finished P3, but it was smooth running all the way through testing. Can anyone touch Red Bull this weekend? And will Christian Horner let their two drivers race each other? Um. The second part of that is no. Um, Perez will always get out of the way for Max. Um, he'll be told to whether it's fair or not. Um, and I don't agree with that. But hey ho, that's always the Red Bull way. Favor the golden trial, just look at Vettel and Weber. Um, with regards to the first bit of that, Ruby, if can anybody get close to them? Yes. I think for I will we'll get we'll get close to them. Um whether whether Ferrari will actually be able to mount a sort of 
consistent challenge th- of, you know, this season remains to be seen. I'd like to see it. I don't think we will because I think they'll implode. Um, but if we can at least just have a couple of races before the, um, you know, you know, if we can at least see a couple of races before the Ferrari engines actually chew themselves and then also the strategists decide to go on, I don't know, like snow change or something in Monaco, um, you know, because I wouldn't put anything past them by this point. I, uh, you know, if Mercedes can get on top of their design, which they seem to be confident in, you know, they've gone for the no side pod approach again, there must be something in there which, which, which they're potentially seeing as good. If they can get on top of that design and the car can actually perform, then we may see it, but I don't think so at this stage. Um, so yeah, so I, I would I would I would say Ferrari are almost going to going to going to be pushing Red Bull um, race day. Perhaps not quite as much because Red Bull just seem to have it. They just have it sorted on race day, or for the most part, anyway. Um, Quali is where Ferrari I think are going to really show their hand. Yeah, and it, to be fair, it was last Bahrain Grand Prix where we did see Charles Leclerc out racing Max Verstappen, or at least out thinking Max Verstappen in the sense of. You know, he needed to get the DRS going up to turn four to keep himself ahead every single lap. Whereas Max Verstappen was like, yes, I will overtake into turn one and then I'll get overtaken coming back into turn four. Um, But that is uh, all of the teams looked at. Now let's start thinking about some predictions. So, Phil, I'm going to start with you. What's your podium prediction for this race weekend? Verstappen, uh, Leclerc. And okay, I do say Mercedes. I, I even though I I'm, I'm muted with my thing, I'm going to say George Russell. So Verstappen, Leclerc, George Russell is my podium. Interesting, Sophia, your podium, please. Uh, I'm going to say Max. <laughs> I and hope the superstition still stands. Um, Charles P two, and I don't want to copy Phil, but I think uh, I think Mercedes has a good shot. Um, but you know what? I'm going to stick to Carlos Sainz. I think it'll be a Ferrari 2-3. A Ferrari 2-3, but that's two dry, That's two panellists saying Verstappen on top. Tommy, are you going to make it three out of three? What's your podium? No, I'm going to manifest. Um, I'm going to say that Leclerc is going to finish P1 um, and then Max is going to be P2. So he can, he can keep the barring curse alive. God damn it, please. Um, and then um, uh, I'm going to throw an oddball in there and I'm going to say one of the Alpines P3. Interesting. So we've all got Max Verstappen for P1. No. Um, no? What did you no. say? I said Leclerc for P1. Oh, yes, you did. Sorry. Um, I was thinking of other things at the, at the time, but um, thank you very much, Tom. <laughs> um, bold predictions then, you know, this is obviously a bit more of a, you know, prediction that's not really going to happen, but it'd be very fun to see. Phil, what's your bold prediction, please? I'm going to manifest this until it happens. Uh, well, first, this is the first step of a multi-step manifestation here. I'm manifesting Logan Sargent making it into Q2. And then if and when that happens, then it's going to go to Q3. It's kind of like how George, well, George used to do with George Russell, getting from Q2 to Q3, and then et cetera, et cetera. So I'm going to take over that mantle from George, and I'm going to do that with Logan Sargent, just to prove that I'm an American fanboy. American fanboy, Philip Matthew. Sophia Richmond, what is your bold prediction, please? Oh, I say... All three, potentially four, if Felipe is racing, will be in the points. So all three, four rookies. Sorry. Oh, uh, right. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. All three, <laughs> maybe four rookies in the points uh, for Bahrain. I think I'm counting on two, but hopefully, maybe all of them. I mean, like we said, Bahrain does have a good track record for rookies, but I think three or even four of them. That might be pushing it a little bit. That would be very bold. Tom Downey, your bold prediction, please. Um, ooh. I, I predict both Williams into Q2. 
both Williams into Q2. Yeah. Ooh. Um, that would be bold, considering how, um, you know, much they seem to be not quite getting the pace there. Um, but those are some predictions. Now we always like to give a chance to, to like our panelists give some self promo because they do all come from, um, you know, different shows, different areas, different things. Phil, if people want to hear more from you, obviously you are on the Grip Strip podcast. Where can they find it? The Grip Strip podcast, you can find us basically anywhere you find podcasts. We go over all things uh, motorsports, four wheels, two wheels. Next episode is episode 158, and we'll be doing previews of the uh, Formula One and IndyCar championship uh, for 2023 on the next episode with uh, my co-host Joshua Fine and so that'll be a, a good long one if you like longer shows uh, one that you can kind of listen to during your day uh, during the week while you're working need a little something in the background definitely listen to the Gripster podcast uh, we definitely like getting into all the different motorsports we'll be covering California Speedway uh, the last race at California Speedway, most likely uh, NASCAR as well, amongst whatever else is going on, World Superbikes debut and et cetera, et cetera. I think you can find us, find me at Philip G. Matthew. You can find our Twitter handle and find Josh at JP Huffine on Twitter. You can find us at Grip Strip Pod on Twitter. We have Grip Strip Podcasts on YouTube where we do the videos. So yeah, give us a like, subscribe, listen, and um, Great job as always, Rubes, and great to be on with uh, Sophia and Tom, and glad to be back for 2023 Formula One. Means we're going to be busy for a while because uh, there's like 800 races, so we'll we'll be seeing a lot of each other this year, and I'll be wearing that Grid Talk merch for sure. Always a pleasure having you back on, Phil. Um, Tom, um, you are obviously a host of Grid Talk. Anything Indeed, else? I am. Uh, not really. Um, I mean, I, I have Instagram, but it's private. Uh, I don't have Twitter. I have LinkedIn, but that's work stuff. I don't really do anything F1 related on there. Um, the, the the main thing is my co-host, who is on this on the, on this very podcast, Sophia. Um, she is the brainchild behind Formula Talk, which I uh, which which I am the. You know, she 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 is the primary host, and I'm the sort of backup host, if you like, the sort of second host. It's it's very, it's very much very much her very much her idea. So that's a that's an exciting new series which she and I are doing. All right, I'll let Sophia explain what Formula Talk is. Then Sophia, um, Formula Talk and everything F1. Give us a look, give us the lowdown. Yeah, um, I'll start with everything F1, then dive into Formula Talk. So everything F1, you can find us on all social media at Join EF1. We have a website called www.everythingf1.com. We do weekly podcasts, sometimes even multiple episodes a week with some great driver lineups. We've had Mario Andretti, uh, Stingray Bob, if you're an IndyCar fan as well, that just went live yesterday. Um, that's on Spotify, Apple, and everything. Um we do articles on just F1, F2, F3, IndyCar, Formula E now, pretty much anything motorsport. But as Tom has mentioned, I pretty much, with Tom supporting me and being an amazing co-host, um, we have just launched Formula Talk, which is part of the F1 Chronicle team, where we post weekly uh, podcasts discussing primarily F2 and F3, but we do mention about uh, Formula Regional Middle East, Formula Regional Asia, the European um, F1 Academy that just started as well being announced. Um, and then anything else that's non F1 related, uh, deep diving into that. It's a quick 40 minute episodes each week. Um, and hopefully we'll get some more faces of the Grid Talk team to join in um, down the line. We recorded, we, we will be recording it live um, starting this season, this week because of the new season starting. Um, but right now you can find us on Spotify under the F1 Chronicle. Absolutely, do check that out. And if you do want to hear any more from me, I am obviously a very frequent host of Grid Talk. But if you want to find me on the socials, you can find me at Rubes, R U U B E Z, or 001 if you're on Instagram, or at Ruby Price on YouTube now that they've got handles. But on that note, Grid Talk is available on YouTube where most 
race weekend shows are recorded live, as well as Amazon Fire, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Music, Verbal and Pocket Casts. Just search Formula One Grid Talk for our huge back catalogue of shows with previews and reactions to qualifying and the race results. Please consider supporting the channel on Patreon so we can get mics, lights and better recording equipment. Also make sure you subscribe so you're the first to know when each new episode is released every single week. We'll be back soon with plenty more F1 content and of course the Bahrain qualifying show, race show, all of that jazz. But thank you very much for listening and goodbye.